Good morning, good afternoon, good night. I'm coming to you from uh, sunny Sydney. Uh, it's a sunrise and a pretty nice morning here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about MicroWatt and Tristan's going to be talking about GHDL. MicroWatt is uh, an open source, uh, open power architecture CPU and GHDL is the premier uh, open source software for simulation and our synthesis of VHDL programs. Uh, and so I'll start by setting the scene. Um, power's been around forever. Uh, it's an architecture that's been around for decades. Uh, it's powered uh, servers and supercomputers and embedded systems for, for those decades. Uh, some of our most recent uh, uh, things of note, I guess, is Summit and Sierra uh, was number one and number two, now number two and number three, uh, huge supercomputers based on the power architecture. Uh, Open Power has been another effort we put together where uh, we basically have been opening up the architecture uh, bit by bit. Uh, and if you look at, for example, our um, firmware stack, we have a completely open source firmware stack from power on through to uh, booting Linux and ultimately running a hypervisor in that KVM. All those components there on that page are open source. They're available on GitHub. Uh, and so, you know, that's an area where we've been pushing through and opening the, the software stack. Uh, one other thing of note, and I'm sure a number of you know about, uh, the Raptor Power9 workstations. That's a completely native uh, Power9 uh, system, and it uses the same open source stack. So the next logical step in that journey was to look at what we could do in the hardware side of things. And so I'm a software person, uh, but uh, you know we've worked with open source software for decades. Uh, it's a great way of developing. I think it's a better way of producing you know, a higher quality products. And the question was, can we look at open sourcing and affect the instruction set and looking to see, you know, open, open implementations, other implementations of the power architecture. And so obviously back in August, uh, we did that. Uh, and the main sets of points here uh, that uh, I'm sure you've probably seen before is that the architecture is now open. Uh, it's royalty free, inclusive patents uh, and some other logistics around the Open Power Foundation moving to the Linux Foundation. Uh, one other thing we did, and this is MicroWatt, we reduced, uh, we sorry, we released a, a simple implementation of the uh, of a, of an open power core called MicroWatt. Uh, so what is MicroWatt? Uh, MicroWatt's just a tiny power core. It uses what we call the Open ISA Scalar subset. Uh, it's written in uh, VHDL 2008, uh, and so uh, you know there's there's a number of, of languages that are used today. Uh, Verilog and VHDL are, are some of the more established ones. Uh, on the VHDL side, as I said, uh, we're using GHDL. Uh, it's really the, the, the best and the only open source implementation uh, for doing synthesis and now, sorry, simulation and now synthesis just as of a number of months ago. Uh, we're using the uh, open source synthesis tools of Yosis and NextPNR for synthesis. Uh, so now it's a completely end-to-end -end open source workflow uh, to go from microwatt all the way through to producing an image for your FPGA. Uh, we're working on GitHub. It's available there. Uh, it uh, uh, some steps here of, of examples of, of exactly what it is. It's very simple. It's single issue. It's in order. Uh, the aim is for it to be easy to understand. So the idea is is that perhaps someone in the software realm could come in, have a bit of a look, and maybe make a, you know a small modification to the core. Uh, and we've seen that over time. A number of uh, my um, teammates from around the world inside IBM have. Uh, added bits along the way. We've also seen some people appear in the community that are, are the more software oriented people and have been able to add small features and the like. So the hope is, is it remains reasonably easy to understand and hackable by you know, people that really aren't um, uh, in, the, in the hardware realm. Uh, we do some re reuse from the open hardware world. Uh, one of the big areas is, is DRAM and ethernet where we bring in um, components from the LightX project. So, you know, the idea of open source and, and software development is to reuse, reuse, reuse. Uh, and that was our idea here was, you know, we don't want to have to double up and, and implement ethernet and DRAM controllers. Uh, so we'll talk a bit more about that later. On the right is the pipeline. It's a fairly standard pipeline where we have a number of stages uh, through fetch, decode, and then um, execute and write back. So it's a pretty, a pretty simple, um, relatively, you know, um, easy to understand core. Uh, here we can see uh, the project on GitHub. Uh, so it's, uh, it's all done in the GitHub workflow. You can go on, you can pull it, you can build it. Uh, you can uh, raise issues, you can um, fix issues, you can raise pull requests, all that kind of stuff. And so there's a, you know, a nice little community around that. 
language support. So uh, you know, the first thing we, we realized is we were able to leverage the strength of, of the PowerPC ecosystem. You know, a lot of stuff worked. I'm um, using a distro tool chain for my development work. Uh, and we've been adding key languages along the way. And there's a number of people there, uh, Mikey, Jordan, Tom, and Paul that have helped along the way. Uh, so what works? The first thing we tried was MicroPython. So I don't know if people have looked at MicroPython before, uh, but it's a really simple implementation of Python and um, really quite powerful. Um, you know, it, it runs on a whole bunch of different microcontrollers uh, from you know, tiny, tiny um, little ones, uh, you know, and up. And it was a relatively easy port. So we were able to take that. And that was, uh, you know, the first interesting workload outside of say, Hello World that ran on MicroWire. Uh, Zephyr was another one. We did a port uh, of, of Zephyr. Uh, and it was uh, relatively easy. It's a, it's a really nice uh, IoT OS. Uh, coming from a Linux background, it feels a lot like uh, Linux in, in maybe the way it's laid out and, and the development process, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, again, quite powerful um, and real simple and, and real tiny and can be configured down to tiny amounts. So and this is a, an interesting space in the embedded world. And, and again, was a relatively easy port for us. Uh, we had a community member, Tom, come up uh, and basically raise a pull request and, and you know, here's, uh, here's all we need for Rust support. And it was interesting in that it, it required, you know, a couple of new instructions. Uh, we hadn't quite got to full compliance yet. And so he added the instructions we needed. And he also added uh, the, you know, the, the infrastructure, the, the harness so that we can build embedded Rust. And so uh, Rust is an interesting language. Uh, it's really up and coming. Uh, it, it's uh, especially interesting in the systems programming world, uh, and uh, you know we were quite happy to see that uh, to see that come on board. Uh, we took a bit of a walk on the wild side. One of our people decided to port forth. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean that was interesting. I was again a relatively easy uh, port. Uh, Jordan Jordan did it. It was pretty cool to see it. Uh, it's not for me, but maybe it's for someone else. And finally, Linux. So Paul McHarris, uh someone on our team in Canberra, did a fantastic job and basically did a bunch of work on both the Linux side as well as the MicroWatt side to um, basically get all of the functionality we need to get Linux running. And what's that functionality? Well, there's, there's quite a lot. You know, we, we took it from a, a core that ran MicroPython or Paul took it from a core that ran MicroPython and had to add all of the, the, the gorp that you have to do to, to run a, you know, a full operating system, uh, translation, exceptions, all these kind of things. Quite a lot of work, a uh, huge effort. And, you know, it's fantastic to see that go in. And so now, um, you know, MicroWatt runs Linux. Um, our resource consumption over time. So these are, these are LUTs lookup tables. It's kind of a measure of resource utilization from an FPGA. Uh, you know, the idea is, is, is the more uh, LUTs you consume, the more resources, resources you consume and potentially the bigger FPGAs, more expensive FPGAs you might need. Uh, it also results in slower build times as well. Uh, so as we went out the door, it was horrendously uh, <laughs> overweight uh, and we, we cut it down uh, um, and Paul and, and Mikey and a number of people worked on cutting it down. Uh, I, the interesting thing was, I guess, you know, a number of people looked at the code and said, uh, you know, it looks like a software person wrote this. And yes, the software person did write, write it originally. I did uh, most of the work. Uh, but quickly, as we realized, you know, more about how we should uh, structure hardware, we pretty quickly uh, realized, you know, we had to do a few things and we got it cut down. We took a bump there on the right. And that's, I think, adding uh, Linux support and, and, and a lot of the extra functionality we need to run all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it is, I mean, it, it is, it is still quite small. It's not huge. Um, and it fits on relatively small FPGAs. Some recent developments. Uh, ben Herrenschmidt did a bunch of work here around getting LightX integrated uh, as well as Florent. Uh, and that's been really good because we pick up, you know, enormous functionality for, for little to no work. Uh, DRAM support, Ethernet support, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it comes basically because we have a standard bus that we connect to, you know, a standard interface. Uh, iCache and Dcache been added as well. We've had branch predictors from Paul McCarris. Interrupts and exceptions come from uh, Mikey and, and Ben. A TLB, and that's a translation lookup uh, buffer. That's for uh, the MMU for being able to translate addresses that Linux needs. Uh, that was Paul. And then ultimately we got Linux going, thanks to Paul. Uh, one other interesting thing we've got is we've got a CI around it. So we wanna know when we break it and what we've done uh, and quickly work out what we need to fix. And uh, Mikey added that too. And this is out of date. We've, we've bypassed uh, 215, but uh, about a month ago, we were at uh, you know, 215 uh, commits. So it's, it's moving along at a decent clip. 
I mentioned before, we have a CI and this has been really useful. Every pull request that goes in goes through a number of tests just to see if the call remains functional. That allows us to make sure that we're not breaking things. Uh, this is, you know, something from the, obviously from the software world that we use pretty heavily uh, and is, you know, just as useful in the hardware world. I talked a bit about hardware reuse. Uh, that's been a big thing, you know, we've, we've been pushing for. We use the Wishbone bus, which is a standard open hardware bus. Uh, it's simple, it's open, and it's widely used. And the advantage there is that now we can take other components in the open hardware world uh, and plug them together. So uh, one big area we uh, interacted with was the Lightex project and Ben and Florent have been fantastic on this front. And we can pick up reasonably really complicated macros like DRAMs and Ethernets. And they basically plug on the, uh, the, um, the um, sorry, the wishbone bus. Uh, and, you know, we get all of that functionality without having to recode it ourselves. Uh, and there's more to come in that space. So that's the core itself. Let's talk about how you simulate and you synthesize. And so there's, there's two core things we have to do when we're building something for an FPGA. We have to simulate it, does it work? And we do that in a software simulation. And ultimately, does it synthesize? Can we build an image that goes on the FPGA and runs? Uh, simulation is done using GHDL, which Tristan uh, is gonna uh, talk a bit about. He's the maintainer for. Uh, it's fantastic for testing, uh, including CI. Uh, it has, I would say, better language support than many of the vendor tools, uh, including VHDL 2008. Uh, and, um, you know, I will say he's very responsive. We've, we've found bugs along the way and, and he's, you know, been very quick to fix them. So as far as uh, simulation environments go, GHDL is, is, is pretty, pretty great. Uh, it's also added synthesis support recently. So, uh, you know, we, we originally were using GHDL for simulation, but then we'd have to go off to a vendor proprietary tool for synthesis. And the vendor tools, are, you know, swings and roundabouts. There's some good parts, some bad parts. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to automate in a, in a CI environment because you are licensed, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of problems with using vendor tools, especially in an open source project. Uh, GHDL recently added a completely open source flow now for FPGA synthesis. So you can go from the VHDL right through in an image that will, you know, that will build and run on, for example, your Lattice uh, FPGA. Uh, and so that's been fantastic. One other thing I'll point out, it also allows, which we haven't really had a, a good option of, um, but being able to convert VHDL to Verilog uh, and that goes through Yosis. So it allows you to do mixed language simulation and synthesis, all this kind of stuff that we haven't really had in the open hardware world. So that's been another uh, great development. Uh, so one thing I will point out uh, is that um, as you get into this, you start to accrue FPGAs. I started with the Arty and then someone gave me uh, one of these little um, lattice boards. And then I picked up, a, I think, a tiny FPGA. And, and then someone at another conference said, here's a few Tomus. Uh, and then I picked up another Xilinx FPGA and, and then another FPGA and, uh, and this little orange crab, which is a fantastic little one done by a maker. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So we'll warn you that, uh, you know, it's pretty addictive and you will pick up, my desk here is full of FPGAs. I can't really even have space to put my cup down, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you aren't involved in Harbour or haven't before, um, you know, and you're a software person, I encourage you to go out and have a bit of a play with some of these things. There's a lot happening in the open hardware world. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, interesting things going on. Uh, and, you know, I'd encourage you all to play. And so with that, I'll um, hand over to Tristan. Hello, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, so my talk is about GHDL and how it, it fits into the inside the EDA ecosystem, and in particular about the free and open source software EDA. So EDA is about electronic design automation, which is. Uh, all the tool sets that are used to do electronic design. Uh, and it's in fact a very vast domain, maybe unknown by software developer, but it's vast. Uh, okay, I can split almost artificially into two points. One about uh, electronics, so doing board, PCBs, designing a uh, new card, and the main uh, tools, many open source tools 
are keycard and I will say PCB. Uh, or the, the other bunch is about microelectronics, so how to create uh, integrated circuits or chips. And uh, you need many, many tools uh, to do that. Uh, synthesizer, you need simulators, you need uh, placer, you need routers, you need timing analyzer, and also you need uh, PDK. And between these two branches, there are also tools uh, for analogic simulation. And they are used either for while doing PCBs, particularly if you do if you use high frequency signals, and also while you design an integrated circuit, if you design uh, an analog uh, circuit or uh, part of a, an analog part of a digital circuit, and also they are also used to uh, for very uh, advanced process that have a lot of noise and uh, where uh, behaviors that need uh, uh, tools uh, to, to be investigated. And I will most talk, mostly talk about integrated circuits in this uh, presentation. So what is integrated circuit? Well, for uh, high view, we can say it's a set of gates, gates which do some computation. So there are elementary gates like NOR and NOT. And if you combine them together, you can create additioner or subtractor or multipliers or things like advanced uh, computation. And in addition to gates, to logic gates, you also have uh, memorizing elements like flip-flop and latch or memories that are used to uh, keep a result available for uh, a longer time. And all these gates and uh, memories are connected through with wires. In addition to this uh, digital element, you almost always have uh, analog components uh, like pads, which are allows to connect uh, part of the circuit to the external world. PLL, which are used to do high frequency clock and a lot of uh, components to do power management. And at some point, the connection between these gates and the wires are what we call the netlist. Um, so how do we design integrated circuits? Uh, initially, you had to draw the mask manually and your, your uh, drawing was used to directly create a circuit. Uh, okay, it was used until the end of the 70s, uh, but obviously it doesn't scale uh, because the number of uh, transistors is now huge and uh, it's very difficult to pack them together. Um, but we can still use uh, hand drawing for some, uh, well, for, the basic, for the basic elements and also for analog elements and also sometimes for uh, the global architecture. But most of the design now are uh, created using language. Well, a special branch of language which are called Hardware Description Language, HDL, and the, uh, two, the, the most two well-known or widely used are Verilog and nowadays System Verilog and the HDL. So how do you design a circuit? Well, I present a very, very simplified flow. So first, once you uh, have defined the architecture, you start to, I would say, code or design using uh, HDL. And you want to check the design before creating the circuit because the creation of a circuit is very expensive or very slow. So you do simulation, which allows you to check that the behavior is correct. 
and also to debug the circuit if you have a, a problem. And once your design is not to be is known to be correct, you do a synthesis, and at that point you create a netlist, which is often a generic netlist that you slightly adapt to your target using uh, a mapper tool. And once you have a spe target specific netlist, you use tools like Placer Router to do the final implementation, the physical implementation. And often you have to do also to, to use also some tools to check the timing or to check the design rules. Um, okay, we also um, artificially split ICs into two branch. So you have either the on one hand the ASIC, which is application specific circuit, which is let's say a real circuit, and on the other hand. Uh, what we call FPGA, which are uh, a circuit which can be programmed. So you have uh, in the FPGA, you have a very generic behavior that you can change to fit what you, what you want to do. Uh, so there are, what is shown there are CLB, which are the compute elements, and all the routing and uh, switch box to interconnect uh, the computation element together and with uh, IOS. So basically, the routing uh, represents the wires and the computation element represents uh, the gates. So the main advantage of FPGA is that you can program them uh, many, many times. So if you create, uh, you don't need, you don't, and it's uh, quite fast, so you, don't, you don't need to do a circuit each time you want to change it. As a drawback, it's uh, much, much slower. Uh, it needs much more uh, energy to run. And it might be much more expensive if you have a, a large number of uh, circuits to, to, to build. So when you use a free and open source uh, software, uh, these are the main uh, actor in this world. Um, so if you look at the standard language at Verilog and BHDS, so for Verilog, you have Verilator and Icarus Verilog to handle and uh, simulate uh, Verilog. So Verilator is uh, very fast, but handles only a subset of Verilog and system Verilog, while Icarus Verilog is much slower but it handles, uh, I would say, uh, it targets, holds uh, the world language. On the VHDL part, you have GHDL, so the tools I have uh, written. And there's also other actors like uh, NCV. Uh, one way to, well, one output of uh, simulation is the waveforms you can try to, which is used to understand how your circuits, uh, how your circuit works. And the main new word is GTK way. And um, uh, software designers also like to create new language because it's much easier when it's uh, open source. And here is a list of uh, recent, recently created language like Shizen, Spinach HDL, Clash, HDL, which are often based on an existing uh, language. And most of the time, they translate their input to a standard language like Verilog or DHDL, which can be used by synthesizers. And to his simulation, you have several verification frameworks like CocoTB, UVM, was UVM, UVM, UVLIT. Okay, so it's just meant, it just allow you to create a large and uh, quickly uh, verification environment for your design. Okay, that was for simulation. Now for physical uh, synthesis. So the design flow is first to do a generic synthesis, then you adapt the netlist created by the synthesis to your target, and then you uh, once you have uh, the netlist, 
you have to transform it into a bit scheme in order to in order uh, to program the FPGA. For front end, so what is what what I mean by front end is the part of the tool that reads your language and creates the netlist. Uh, most of them are based on Yosis, and the HDF can be used as a front end, but for uh, as a plugin of Yosis. And you always you also have uh, Odin too. For map, uh, the main tool is Yosis, which uses ABC from Berkeley to do the mapping. And from place and route, it exists only for very few FPGA. And open source tools exist only for very few FPGA. And the main ones are Next, PNR, and VPR. So what is uh, GHDL? Um, first, it's a simulation tool, and it uh, supports uh, the full language, for the world VHDA language until version uh, 2002, and also most of the features of 2008. Um, it doesn't interpret your code, but it compiles. So it directly creates, at the end, you, uh, most of the time, you get an executable that can be run uh, directly. Uh, and it does use either LLVM or GCC as a, to generate uh, object code, or it has also an internal uh, JIT called encode. And the uh, executor created can also generate web forms. And since, uh, since last year, it also do synthesis, and it can either output the generic uh, netlist created, or it can also be used as a Yosis plugin and then fit into the design flow. Um, okay, let's see if you have any question about JTL or about microwave, it's, uh, it's time to ask a question. Thanks, Tristan. We had a couple of questions on the Q&A, which I've been trying to answer. I don't know if... Um, for some strange reason, my um, my answers, at least here, seem to be line wrapped to like uh, maybe a dozen characters. So hopefully it's intelligible. Uh, we'll see if there's any more. So we, we had a set of questions from Bill and, and Tulio around um, GLIPC support. So that's that's ongoing at the moment. And I think, as Bill said, uh, it's the right time for us to, to sit down and look to see you know, if there's anything we can do in that space. Uh, around uh, allowing uh, GLibc uh, in the LE realm to be um, more uh, to allow um, uh, more of the subsets than it does today, uh, and so that's that's something ongoing that we'll um, we'll start working on. I don't know if there's any any other questions for either uh, Tristan or myself in the Q and A. I think we've only got a couple minutes, but well, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, so if not, uh, I guess uh, I guess we're good. I think in the chat, there's there's a Slack channel as well if people want to continue to engage later on. Uh, the other thing I mentioned, uh, we do have a uh, so there is a Slack channel for Microwatt. There's a I think it's a Gitter channel for GHDL, so you can find them pretty easily. Both them pretty easily if you uh, if you Google for them, uh, and you know there's both a community around uh, that that uh, that you can engage with if you want to talk about uh, anything. Uh, if you have another VHDL project, give it a go on GHDL. Uh, I think I saw maybe Bill uh, on the, the channel just there. You know, there's been some experimentation that Tristan had with getting A2I to synthesis, to, sorry, to simulate with, with GHDL. I don't know if uh, A2O has been done yet. That might be something we can play with next. But, uh, you know, if, if you've got an, a VHDL project, it's definitely worth playing with GHDL to see how it goes. Um, yeah, and that's. I think that's all I've got. So unless there's uh, anything else, I think uh, I think we're good. Thank you for for turning up, and uh, you know, hope to see you on on GitHub, maybe playing with Microwatt sometime in the future. Thank you. <laughs>